Following on the success of The Vampire Doll, Toho would move on with a sequel the following year, titled Lake of Dracula. There isn't really any Dracula in this movie, just like there wasn't really a vampire doll in the previous one when you think about it. The distributors over at the US just thought the title sounded cool and ran with it. The two movies, along with a third one released a few years later, would all be directed by Michio Yamamoto and become collectively known as the Bloodthirsty Trilogy. The sequel would dial up considerably the gothic horror influence, much to the director's chagrin, I presume, going from a dark thriller that played a lot with and subverted common vampire tropes to a much more traditional tale of blood-sucking leeches feeding on helpless humans. The whole plot surely wouldn't feel out of place in a Hammer production. The story concerns Akiko Kashiwagi, a high school teacher who lives in a cabin by a lake with her much cuter sister Natsuko and their dog Leo, while dating handsome surgeon Dr. Takashi. Her life is not perfect though, as Akiko is tormented by nightmares in which she's a small child in a beach, but ends up getting lost and finding an old and creepy house and its evil inhabitants. The woman copes with this by drawing big scary eyes and leaving them around the house for everyone to feel scared with her. Despite that, Akiko and everyone around her dismisses the nightmares as harmless, and nobody spends much time thinking about them. That is, until the day a mysterious package delivered by the grave digger from the last movie arrives to the boat keeper who lives next door to Akiko, played by the butler from the last movie. This time he's a normal human being though. Wonder what's in the box? Nice! I see not everyone appreciates the art of coffin making these days. Is there a corpse in it? No, just someone's menstrual blood. Uh oh. Later that night, Akiku stops by the boathouse to ask for the man to fix the broken door at her house. But instead of finding this jolly weirdo, she's greeted by this somber pretty boy and... Girl, come on! You deserve better than that dork you've been dating. What matter if this guy is a creep? And you might remember Shin Kishida as the Interpol agent from 1974's Godzilla vs Mechagodzilla. See? Everything's connected. The next day, just as Akiko and Atsuko are returning to their house from the city, they notice Leo's bizarre absence from the place surroundings. Leo! <sighs> I can't think of a joke for that. Genzo, help me out, you are normal now. Genzo, no, what the fuck? The man knocks the lights off of Akiko and brings her to his master at the boathouse. What would have been a bloody feast for the vampire is interrupted by two rednecks who stop by the boathouse to rent a boat, as you normally do in a boathouse. The two gentlemen don't even offer a ride to Akiko, who has to return home in the middle of the night while crossing the woods. Upon returning home, Natsuko is nowhere to be seen, what makes her sister even jumpier than before. <laughs> Akiko accounts the horrible events that transpired to her that day, to which Natsuko responds. What a girl. Anyway, even later that night, Akiko sees her sister walking into the woods, so she decides to follow her. <laughs> Somewhere else, Natsuko is having a late night run-in with the Prince of Darkness himself, or whoever this bozo happens to be. 
Oh yeah, suck me, daddy. Dracula don't suck. Dracula scrape and lick. Next morning, Takashi comes to the lake house, and Akiko desperately throws herself into his arms, looking for comfort. Not satisfied with having dismissed her sister's apprehensions, as pure paranoia just wants, Natsuko comes down the stairs from her room, saying that Akiko dreamed seeing her leaving the room last night. For a moment, the woman starts questioning her own sanity. Takashi was supposed to stay for dinner with her fiancé, but is notified by Natsuko that he has been summoned by the hospital he works for an emergency. Tell me, babe, do you think there's something weird with your sister? No, honey, why do you ask? For nothing, bye. Bye, handsome. As the doctor is departing, Akiko is surprised by the mysterious man waiting for her with Natsuko on the inside. The guy then proceeds into flirtatiously praise Akiko's artistic skills. I call it bold and brash. More like belongs in the trash! The boyfriend from this movie is driving through the exact same road from the last movie when he's attacked by the same weirdo also from the last movie. I, I can't keep calling him Genzo, what is his name? Kyuzaku? Anyway, Kyuzaku goes out in the rain holding a piece of metal and gets hit by a lightning. Takashi then checks the body and notices two holes in his neck. Back at Akiko's house, the woman tries to no avail escape the claws of her aggressor, while listening to her sister's taunts. <laughs> Takashi arrives just as Akiko frees herself from the evil dude and, once again, runs to her fiancé's arms. To everyone's surprise though, the mysterious man has disappeared from the house along with Natsuko. Tired of having that ugly painting of hers always watching over her shoulder, Akiko destroys it. The couple then updates each other on what has happened so far, finally concluding that A. They are dealing with a vampire, and Atsuko has been turned into one of them, and B. Akiko's dream wasn't just a dream, it was a memory of a past trauma she had blocked. It was then time to finish this drama once and for all, going after the house where it all began so many years ago. After tracking down the beach from the dream, they managed to find the house itself, a decrepit place hidden among the bushes and amid the mist. In this morbid place they find... Uh, they find this old fart journal, the last entries of which conveniently describe the missing pieces of the puzzle. The man is the vampire's father, and he comes from a long lineage of monsters. The gene witch had skipped him, but not his son who became a bloodsucker the very day Akiko wandered into the house dependencies. Thankfully for her, the old man was there to save the little girl from the vicious vampire, who wanted to turn her into his... Right? What? The two get cornered by the evil being and Atsuko, both of which want to get a bite of them. The vampire who did and still does struggle to get a good grip on Akiko also tosses Takashi around like a ragdoll. It would be the end for our heroes if not for the villain's father suddenly coming back to life and making his son trip into a stake. After this unnecessarily dramatic and slapsticky death, Natsuko reverts back to her rosy self. Dead is it still dead though. Like I said, this wouldn't feel out of place in a Hammer movie, even though it tries to retain some of the more psychological and grounded aspects of its predecessor without the childhood trauma and sibling jealousy talk, Lake of Dracula is much more gruesome and visceral than the first flick, no doubt about it, something that contributes to a more gothic horror flavor. Whether this was detrimental to the movie as a whole, 
or made for a more enjoyable experience is up to you. I for one think this one lags behind in relation to its predecessor, even if not by much. But this is the path the trilogy would continue on. For the third and final entry of the Bloodthirsty trilogy, Shin Kishida would return as a different sexy vampire, wandering the night while terrorizing a girls-only boarding school. Ugh.